um, and welcome to Need to Know, a new video interview series featured here on the Lowy Institute's digital magazine, The Interpreter. My name is Lydia Khalil. I'm a research fellow with the West Asia program at the Lowy Institute. And today I'm talking with Ben Hubbard, the New York Times Beirut bureau chief and the author of the recently published book, MBS, The Rise to Power of Mohammed bin Salman. First of all, Ben, thank you for joining us. Thanks for um, making the time for a call all the way out from the Middle East. Yeah, hi, Lydia. Thanks for having me. Well, let me first start by asking, how, how are you? How are you coping with the pandemic? What does the pandemic look like from your vantage point in the Middle East? Well, for, for living in a region that is often the center of dramatic news events, we've done quite well here. Uh, cases in Lebanon have been fairly low, and we haven't had a lot of the scenes of the overwhelmed hospitals and things like that. So I've been playing it quite careful in my own uh, going out and mixing with people. And uh, the country is opening up. I'm a bit worried that we'll get hit on the second wave. But um, so far, so far, so good. Well, it's good to know that you're doing well. Um, you know, we'll have to keep um, cautions up for, you know, all over the world, really, for what's going to ha happen after a reopening. But let's get straight into um, what we're here to discuss, which is your recent book on Mohammed bin Salman, who is currently the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. Um, now, you've been writing and visiting the kingdom for quite a long time now. And as you point out in your book and your writing, um, Saudi Arabia is a country that's not really known for being the type of place where change and events move um, in a fast pace. In fact, one would say Saudi Arabia moves at an incremental, sometimes even glacial pace. Uh, and it's also a relatively opaque society. It's not an easy place to get to know. Um, you know, the popular imagination just has it associated with basically oil and Islam. And then along comes a figure like MBS who has seemingly come out of nowhere uh, and comes and starts to really shake things up in Saudi society, and not just domestically, but in terms of Saudi Arabia's place in the world. Now, for the most part, he was not a known figure uh, to us in the West. He wasn't directly in line for the throne, as you point out in your book. And then in 2015, when his father becomes king, he becomes appointed crown prince, minister of defense, head of Aramco, lead Saudi's economic transformation and starts enacting all of these sweeping changes to Saudi Arabia. So how did this even happen? Did he in fact come out of no, nowhere? How, how was he able to sidestep this kind of slow moving royal hierarchy in Saudi Arabia to, to get where he is and to do what he's doing? Well, there are a few elements. But I think the, the, the first way, he, it basically starts because of luck. I mean, the fact that his father was the one to become king, if his father had not become king, then you know, then he never would have had his shot. I think after that, his, his relationship with his father comes into play. He's somebody who had had a very, very close relationship with his father. He has a number of older half brothers who are in many ways much more accomplished than he is. I mean, in terms of classic resume sense and people who have actually, you know, done things that would seem to put them in a good position to be the next leader of Saudi Arabia. His father skips over all of them and chooses Mohammed bin Salman, who is his sixth son. And since he's a king of an absolute monarchy, he can pretty much choose whoever he wants. And so when he designates Mohammed bin Salman, then that he becomes the he becomes the guy. The then I think Mohammed bin Salman's own characteristics very much take over his own attributes. And there's there's kind of an element of shock and awe in how fast this guy works and how many of the conventions that he breaks. I mean, Saudi Arabia was a very and especially royal family politics were governed by a lot of unwritten rules about who got to do what and, you know, deference to elders and how, you know, how you sort of behave in relationship to other royals. And MBS just sort of shatters a bunch of these conventions and decides I'm going to do things the way that I want to do them. I'm not interested in sort of kowtowing to these older princes that I don't like. Some of them I'm going to lock up. Some of them I'm going to put under house arrest. Some of them I'm going to shove out of the way so that I can become the crown prince. And, uh, and this is exactly what he does. And it, 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 it's a combination of him having the backing of the king and in a absolute monarchy, people still do defer to the king. And so a lot of people who weren't happy with what he was doing weren't gonna go against him because they knew that his father was, was backing what he was doing. And I think there was also just an element of surprise. He was acting so fast and doing things that were so out of the ordinary that people were just taken by surprise and didn't really know what to do about it. And, and then so we look back a few years later and realize like, well, he's kind of taken the place over and now he's the, you know, now he's in charge. And so tell us about some of these fast moving things. What, what were these sweeping and bold changes that he wanted to make um, in Saudi Arabia? You know, what were they and what were his motivations for doing them? Well, you can put them in a number of groups. I mean, I think what the, there, there's sort of the whole category of social change. I mean, he came in, said, we realized that Saudi Arabia is a very boring place to live, especially for the many, many Saudi young people. And so he starts 
bringing in, in entertainment, he, you know, opens movie theaters, brings in, you know, concerts, pro wrestling, monster truck shows, things like that. And these are things that Saudi Arabia didn't have primarily for religious reasons. They felt that these were cultural imports from the West and these were going to, you know, get in the way with the, of, the, of the proper practice of Islam as Saudi Arabia saw it. So the social changes have been vast. I think they've been a huge change for especially Saudi young people and especially young Saudi women who were not allowed to drive, who were sort of barred from pursuing a number of different careers. And a lot of that has changed. So that was kind of one basket. The next basket would be economic reform. I mean, he came in and talked about the kingdom is addicted to oil and we need to break our addiction to oil. We need to diversify the economy. We need to, you know, vital, uh, invigorate the private sector so that it can create jobs for all of these young Saudis so they don't have to count on the government. So that's kind of another, and then you have the privatization of Aramco, which people probably read about was another piece of that. Then the, politically, he was never a reformer in terms of, um, you know, sort of pol political reform in terms of changing how the place was governed or the role that citizens could play in determining who governs them and how. But there was very much along with all the rest of this an authoritarian consolidation that he very much pulled all of the power in Saudi Arabia into his own hands and used that sometimes in quite almost brutal ways to um, get rid of people that he considered a threat to himself. Yeah, so that's what I, that's what I wanted to ask you about next. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia was never really considered a, dem a democracy by any means, but it kind of had its own way of consult consultation, um, at least within the Saudi royal court. And then he seemed to kind of get rid of all of that um, when he came to power. And um, then some of his behavior not only did that, it became, but it became much more thuggish and authoritarian. Um, and even though he had this kind of promising reputation among uh, the Western business and tech sector, particularly, and was kind of believed to be the one to bring liberalization and promise to Saudi Arabia, there's been this disconnect with maybe some of the more progressive social and economic changes that MBS was pushing for and, you know, which honestly were much needed in Saudi Arabia, but then his decidedly illiberal way of getting these changes enacted. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. And particularly, I'm interested in, you know, how, how quickly the, the, the Western business and tech sector embraced him in the beginning and, and why that was so. Well, I think the, 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 the easiest way to explain it is that Saudi Arabia has a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and so when, you know, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia comes calling, people are interested in talking to him because you never know what's going to come out of it, what kind of deal you might get. I mean, he took these Two, two trips in early 2018, one to the UK and then one to the United States. And they were absolutely remarkable, the number of people that he met with. In the US alone, I think he visited five states, the District of Columbia, he met three former presidents, he met Trump in the White House, he met Bill Gates, he met Jeff Bezos, he met Mark Zuckerberg, he went to Hollywood, he went, I mean, he kind of traveled all over the place and all these people threw open their doors for meetings with him. And, um, so part of, it, part of it was just that, you know, when Saudi comes calling, there's a lot of money that could potentially be involved. And so people are interested in listening to that. And then there was but, also but this again, idea that th there was also this, again, this interest in the social changes. There was also this idea that, wow, if this guy is going to change these things in Saudi Arabia that everybody's been complaining about, the ban on women driving, restrictions on women, these, these kind of um, very, very strict, austere interpretation of Islam that's caused problems around the world. Well, then this is something that we want to get behind. So I think that was, that was also a motivation for the interest in Mohammed bin Salman earlier on. But then give it to us in a little bit more context. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia has always had a lot of money, has always thrown that money around, has a big sovereign wealth fund, has done a lot of investment. Um, it, it still seemed a bit different, the reception that he got versus previous Saudi leaders or ambassadors or, um, you know, other, other high profile figures within um, the Saudi court. Do you think that's true? Or, um, you know, was his just style just different and much more appealing? Well, I think it was, I think it was A, that people wanted to be involved in this sort of dream of a changing Saudi Arabia, that that was attractive. And he was also interested in sectors that, that Saudi leadership had never really been interested in before. I mean, they never pursued the tech sector before. And so the fact that he wanted to go to Silicon Valley and visit the Google campus and hang out with Mark Zuckerberg and try on a you know, virtual reality headset, these are things that other senior royals had never done before. And the same with Hollywood. I mean, you know, the kingdom had always sort of looked at Hollywood as this kind of bastion of infidelity that was going to corrupt their morals. And next thing you know, MBS wants to go and have dinner with Rupert Murdoch and, you know, Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, and people and talk about how he can bring more entertainment to Saudi Arabia. So it was just that there was also an interest from someone at his level. We've never seen that before in these kinds of sectors from Saudi Arabia. Right. But then all of that 
took a major hit, right, with some of the more troubling and gruesome behavior that he was behind, you know, especially the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, you know, hugely impacted his international reputation. Um, but it seems like, and, and actually not just that, but also, you know, we've heard stories about like mass detentions of Saudi royals, um, the jailing of other individuals who've criticized or challenged him, even individuals who, um, push for the same changes that he actually enacted. I mean, we heard stories about him jailing some of the female activists who pushed for the, um, uh, the, the lessening of the driving ban, for example. Um, uh, talk us through some of the more problematic aspects that kind of started to hit MBS's reputation in the West. Well, I think for people who were paying attention, they started quite early on. I think the, the first thing would have been the Saudi military intervention in Yemen, which started a few months after, after um, MBS came onto the scene after his father became king. Um, and the Saudis didn't start the war in Yemen, but they intervened militarily very quickly to try to sort of push this rebel group that had taken over the capital back to where they thought they should be. And, but it, it very quickly becomes a disaster. I mean, it, it's clear that their fighter pilots don't really know what they're doing. They bomb weddings, they bomb funerals, they kill, you know, really uncounted numbers of civilians. So that was an earlier thing. Once you get into 2017, you've got sort of the, the detention and forced resignation of Prime Minister Saad Hariri of Lebanon, which is, I don't know if people remember this sort of bizarre incident where yeah. they, they summon the Prime Minister of another country, force him to resign, hoping that it's going to sort of change the political dynamics of that country. That fails, but it looks very bad for Saudi Arabia. There's the lockup at the Ritz-Carlton, which people might remember when MBS sort of tasks officials at the Royal Court and the secret police with rounding up you know, a, a few hundred of the kingdom's richest and most powerful men and locking them in the Riyadh Ritz-Carlton to, um, you know, accusing them of corruption and taking away significant portions of their assets. So there was that, and then there were, there were the arrest campaigns, and these kind of took different forms and really hit all kinds of parts of society. You had waves of arrests that just targeted clerics, conservatives, intellectuals, people like that, right before the women driving ban, which was listed, which, which really should have been like a one-time only PR coup for Saudi Arabia and for Mohammed bin Salman. They go out and they arrest some of the best known women activists and also male activists who'd been involved and put them in jail. And so, you know, people are sort of saying, congratulations for finally giving women the right to drive in 2018, but it would have been nice if you hadn't also arrested those women. And some of them are still, at least one of them is still detained. I think some of the men are as well. And there's, you know, their court cases are still going on with sort of bizarre charges that nobody outside of Saudi Arabia really thinks are anything but a political way to, to, to uh, undermine them. Right. And so, um, you know, all of that promise has obviously um, taken a hit by all of those actions. And even the detentions still continue. You know, there have been reports that there have been further detentions of members of the royal family. Um, but, you know, it seems like if it's not forgotten, at least some of this bad behavior has been generally... Uh, swept under the rug. And I, I want to finish off with this last related question to that. It seems like, you know, this environment that we're in with the pandemic seems have provided an opportunity globally um, for MBS to also reemerge and rehabilitate his, his reputation and standing internationally. And here I'm thinking of, you know, recent reports where uh, Saudi Arabia is on the hunt for investment bargains you know, in coronavirus affected industries like, you know, the media and entertainment and there's reports that he wants to invest in a English football company. So it seems like, you know, this bad behavior, especially now with the current global economic environment um, has been very much swept under the rug and there's now more opportunities for him to, um, yeah, to, to rehabilitate Saudi Arabia and to get back into the international scene. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? It's possible. It's hard to see where it's going to go. I think there. I, I think things are moving so dramatically because of the coronavirus. It's a little hard to predict where they're going. I mean, it is true that the Saudi, you know, public investment fund has been going shopping for sort of bargain basement assets that they hope are going to recover. They invested in Carnival Cruise Lines, Live Nation. You know, they're trying to get in all different sectors where they haven't been before. I mean, who knows? Maybe Carmel, Carnival Cruise Lines will never recover, and it'll turn out to be a bunk investment. Or maybe you know, five, ten years from now, it'll turn out to be something really smart that Arabia did. We don't really know. I think that the reputational stain is still there. I think that people, when they hear the name Mohammed bin Salman, they still think directly about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul in 2018. Um, so I think there's still going to be a resistance. At the same time, Saudi Arabia still has a lot of money. It's still a very, you know, incredibly influential country in the Muslim area, in the, in the, both in the Muslim world and in the Middle East. And so, you know, he's going to remain a player, but I do think that there's going to continue to be on his reputation from you know a lot of these things that he's been involved in. One of the things to, to really watch 
what happens in the U.S. election this year. Um, Donald Trump has had an incredibly close relationship with Mohammed bin Salman. His son-in-law, Jared Kushner, has had a very close personal relationship with Mohammed bin Salman. And so the Trump administration has very much served as a firewall around MBS for a lot of the riskier things that he's wanted to do. Should Joe Biden win in November? major change for U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia. You know, I don't want to get too much into sort of reading the tea leaves and predicting, but uh, not a lot of reason to believe that uh, a Biden administration would treat Mohammed bin Salman in the same way as the Trump administration. Yeah, it was certainly injected um, uh, an additional la layer of unpredictability, you know, with Saudi Arabia and, and regional and global relations. Um, but we're glad that uh, we have your book to help us sort out um, some of the thinking around that and perhaps give us a bit of perspective to look at into the future about what happens with MBS, Saudi Arabia, Middle East and, and global relations. So, Ben, I want to thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, best of luck um, in the Middle East and, and thank you for joining us at the Lowy Institute. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.